it's great to uh, be here with everyone under difficult circumstances, but it's wonderful to have this technology to bring us all together. Uh, my name is Shlomo Brody. I'm the executive director of Ema Thai. And uh, we had this idea, I think, that sprung up to run this program after some thoughts that I had uh, here in Israel after the beginning of the outbreak of the war last uh, Shabbat, Simchat Torah. And immediately after Shabbat, I know for many people here, uh, it was already on Shabbat as well. We were getting contacted by loved ones, family and friends in America and Canada and England and all other places around the world. Of course, we're very concerned with what's going on in Israel. And in the subsequent week and the subsequent days really already, in many conversations with family and friends, people were saying things to me like, I don't know how you're doing it. I can barely deal with this. I'm not sleeping at night. I'm worried, scared. I'm worried about you. I'm worried about family members who are serving in the army. Uh, I'm worried about uh, international reaction. I'm worried about what's going on campuses. And the common theme was a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of just general concern. And so we had the idea with our friends at the Nefesh Benefesh and the Medical Council of America uh, to partner uh, with uh, LifeStore, which is an incredible organization that we talk to a lot and work with a lot, who focus on dealing with questions of uh, how to cope with illness and, and loss and to focus in many ways on attitudes and approaches and positivity towards dealing with difficult situations. And I know I've learned a tremendous amount uh, from the people that we're working with here tonight, with Devorah Korn, the co-founder of LifeStore, with uh, Micha Manasha, one of the senior directors of uh, LifeStore, who have given me a tremendous amount of insight in terms of dealing with many different types of questions that I have to deal with in my job, and I'm confident they can be able to help us tonight in thinking about how we can maintain our calmness, how we can deal with our anxiety, how can we maintain a certain amount of hope, and most importantly, in many ways, to also give support to our loved ones here in Israel from afar. And so it's a pleasure for me to have uh, Devorah and Michal with us uh, this evening, this evening here in Israel, to sort of guide us and try to be very practical right now in giving tools that can help us think about some of these challenges that hopefully we can implement in our lives and share with loved ones as well. So Devorah and Michal, thank you so much for your partnership. Uh, thank you for joining and being part of this conversation. I'm so for, looking forward to learning much from you. Thank you, Rabbi Brody, and thank you to our partners at Nefesh Benefesh and the RCA. Um, we're very touched, slide next, Michal, we're very touched to have this opportunity to be with you. Um, we're in this together. And as we approach the evening, or the morning or the afternoon, depending on where you are, I want to emphasize that as much as this is about how you help us here or your family members here, we're very mindful about how hard it is for you to be there. I was actually in the States when the war broke out. I was fortunate enough to be on the LL flight the next day and just being there and not being here, no matter where you sit in terms of Aliyah or family, it is very, very, very different, very hard in very different ways. I've lived in Israel for 26 years. Um, I grew up in New York and Boston, lived in the Cherry Hill, New Jersey area. And uh, my role as an occupational therapist and as a family therapist since we've made Aliyah is really working with people in the most desperate, desperate hours. Or I thought so until last Saturday. I think that the desperate hours that we are all facing right now are beyond anybody, at least since the Shoah. I'm a second generation. My father escaped the Nazis. I think we are we are in those very dark places. And so tonight, today, um, we're gonna try to unpack a little bit. We're gonna try to look at different skills and different tools, but I don't promise to offer any recipes, formulas, easy fixes. I think each of you here, I know each of you here comes from a rich background of coping. Our people comes from a rich background of coping. We are tremendously resilient, especially when we're together. We have tremendous strengths. And what we're gonna try to do this evening is to reframe this experience in a way where we can somehow begin to wrap our heads around this horror and somehow begin to pull the resources from within us so that we can get through it. And there are different stages to getting through it. 
we are still in the very early stages. We know this is not going to be simple or easy. We've already experienced tremendous pain, but I promise you that you have skills that will be utilized if you can just touch them, put your finger on them. And that's what I'm going to hope to try to do, just like we do every day in our organization with people in very, very, very dark hours where you think there was no hope. Next slide. Before we go forward, I'm going to do something with you. I know many people are allergic to meditation, so I promise you this is going to be super short. But I'm going to give you an opportunity to practice a very tiny mindfulness exercise. Why is this important? There is so much noise around us. There is so much hysteria around us. And yet we, every single one of you, there are 70 people in this group right now, are sitting in one place in safety. Right now, each of us is in one place, on our chair, on our sofa, in our bed, in safety. Now let's take that moment to close our eyes or look at some place where you can concentrate and focus where you're not distracted and think about where you are right now. Think about your body sitting in the chair or on the bed or on the sofa and rest your eyes so that your mind begins to get quiet. Let's leave for the next 50 something minutes ahead of us. Let's leave the noise outside. Let's be here and let's be now. So take a breath and just let your breath revolve naturally. Notice how you're breathing. Some of you have rushed on here. Some of you have come from other places. Allow your breathing to go into a regular rhythmic, more normal pace if it isn't already. Don't rush to change it. Just allow yourself to notice your breathing. Take the breath in and let the breath out. Notice your body, notice how you feel. Pay attention. Are there places in your body that feel tight, strained, stressed? Try to breathe into those places softly and quietly. You are here in a safe place. Put your hands on your legs or on your hips and feel that you are here now and safe. Okay, and slowly open your eyes now and join us. That's the kind of model that we wanna to get to with the people we care for too. It's a tiny, tiny exercise. Michal, next slide. It's a tiny exercise, but it's something that we can do for ourselves when we see a terrible news report, stop, breathe, and relax and try to get to the place of I am here, I am safe. Now, I know each of you, there are 80 people now in this webinar, each of you came here because something major things are bothering you. Well, we're not okay, so that's, that's why. I want us to take a moment. We have, um, we have a chat, which we're gonna ask you questions on. So. Every so often, I'm going to ask you something. I want you to put it in the chat. There's also a Q&A where you have, if you have any general questions, we're monitoring both. But I'll direct you every so often because we want to hear from you and we want people to share things, okay? So just quickly in the chat, and Michal and Shlomo and others will just bring it to the group. What are the things that are hard? There's so much that's hard, but let's let's hear. what What is hard? What is hard now? Right now, what are the challenges now? Okay, let's, can somebody read those so we can yeah, hear them? Being, being alone, alone worrying about deployed worrying cousins. About deployed cousins. I'm seeing them now. I can okay, see good. Being far away, um, shattering the illusion that things will be okay. They're coming so quickly. Mm -hmm. You're all seeing them now, waiting. Okay, there's so many worrying about getting home, anger, worrying about the hostages, worrying about parents. There's so many feeling helpless. Anti-Semitic responses, the reservists, the boys that are on the line, worrying about them, people not understanding. There's so many things here. Being far is hard, not being able to do something from being far, somebody wrote. Helping children stay calm, being here, not there. Okay, I'm sure there'll be more. I'm, I'm gonna allow the, the, the chat to continue. Okay, these are some of the challenges that we face. And if we had more time, we would be hearing more of them, okay? 
this is hard stuff objectively. Okay. Nobody can tell you it's going to be okay. We pray, we hope, but today it is hard. And it's not going to change when somebody says he ever said there. What's going to make it okay for us every day is how we respond to it today, tomorrow, and the next day. People are worrying about the big story. We have to worry about how we take care of ourselves and the people near and dear for us. Okay. So all these things that you've said, and we have a slide that just, you know, recaps some of the things that we've been hearing, being helpless, sad, loss, fear, anger. I want to talk about the physical things. We're going to get into that in a minute, like the physical things that you feel that your family members are talking about. They're not sleeping. They're not eating. They're crying. They're feeling pain in their bodies. I said to my husband the other day after a funeral, my heart aches. I've never felt my heart ache. I really felt it there. Okay. So we're feeling things on the emotional and on the physical level, and you've written them, and they're very, very, very real. We have to pay attention to that. Okay. Now, when we think about that, next slide, what we want to be able to do, and I've kind of started with that with the meditation, is create a sense of safety in this chaos, in this doom and gloom, in this horror. We as humans are entitled to feel safe. It's a basic, basic right that you take a baby and you hold a baby and when they cry, you want them to feel safe. We are primitively wired to need to feel safe. And when the world is crazy and missiles and sirens are going, we need to know that we can still gain a sense of composure and safety, but it's complicated. And this complication in this webinar particularly is really where we're going to try to tackle that. Why? Because what's safe for you in Teaneck, in Toronto, in LA, in Cleveland, in London, what's safe for you and what you need may not be the same as in Jerusalem, in Beersheba, in Ophakim, in the north of Israel, or even among your, your family members. You're in Teaneck and somebody else is in um, in Maryland, in Baltimore, and you have different needs. So besides the idea of saying we're going to try to create calm and safety, we need to understand that for everybody that feels and looks different. For some people, it's being quiet. And for some people, it's talking and processing. And that helps us feel safe. That helps us regain a sense of our being, our self, or who we are. So when we try to do this, creating a safe place, it sounds so nice, right? We try to do it. We need to recognize that it is different for every person, just like every relationship is different, right? You know that when you speak to a spouse or you speak with your child or you speak with your neighbor, the language that you use to create a sense of connection is different because your relationship is different. And if somebody's in a crisis, that's a different situation. So creating safety among the chaos is probably our biggest challenge. And it's one of the things we're going to try to aim towards is trying to understand how can we do it, but recognizing that it is different for everybody. So one of the things and one of the tools that we use tremendous a lot all the time in our work is understanding that listening is complicated and it's actually a skill we need to hone. Now we think we listen, we think we're hearing and we as, as good as we are when there's so much noise and that means noise outside that also means noise in our heads. Our anxiety creates noise. Our heart beating creates noise. So one of the things we want to do is try to communicate clearly. What does that mean? If we're going to, to reach out, let's say, to a child, an adult child who's living in Israel, we want to be able to say, if we're going to call them at a certain when? time, when? Okay, does somebody want to say something? <laughs> Something Is there something I'm supposed to respond to? I'm not hearing. No. To communicate clearly. What does that mean? If you say to somebody, we're going to check in, think about maybe checking in at a particular time every day. In other words, the clarity of that, right? I'll tell you an example. I said to my daughter, let's talk at a certain time. Let's watch news at a certain time and not others. In other words, regimenting communication might be a way of communicating clearly. Not we'll catch we'll catch up with each other, but maybe we'll start our day by by talking. You know, at six o'clock a.m. at ten o'clock your time p.m. If it's you know that time difference, communicating clearly. 
Another thing is giving undivided attention. You know, we're talking to people and we're so noised. We have our cell phone beeping with the WhatsApp going and the emails popping and the TV going. We need to take some time and it's very difficult to do, but it makes all the difference to put the phone on silent and put it to the side, give it to somebody else and say, watch my phone if we feel that we need to, but to just give that undivided attention because we're competing with so much that for us to feel the connection, we need to create, again, that safe space. We need to block out some of those things. The other thing is we want to give people a chance to express their emotions. Now, this is not a therapy session here. And either neither is your conversation with your loved one who's far away. But we want to create an opportunity for people to know that they can express things. And if they feel flooded, to be able to try to say, maybe there's somebody that you need to talk to. In other words, I don't expect each of you to be able to handle the intense, intense emotions on a phone call from far away all the time. But to be able to have somebody express and say, I'm feeling this, you know, I'm feeling intense anxiety. I feel like I'm going to faint. I feel like I'm going to pass out to say, okay, you're feeling anxiety. Reflect back to them. But then say, maybe there's somebody we can set you up to talk to. There's tons of hotlines here in Israel. We have Natal and we have Iran and we have Life Store. We have a million organizations that are and, and Nefesh Benefesh. Let people express, don't marginalize, validate, but then give them a chance to process those emotions in a place where somebody can really help them. At the same time, make sure that everybody knows that what they're saying is important. It's not just about validating, it's recognizing that these are intensely important words. And not only because people need help, but because people need to say what's going on. In our neighborhood here in Caesarea, I'm part of a Kehila here in Caesarea. I live in Jerusalem and Caesarea part of the time. And uh, we had families coming in because we're a safe harbor for now. And we had families coming in from Beit Maimon and Ofakim and Sterot. And we went over there to bring food and to welcome them into the homes that we could find for them to stay in. And it was clear that these people just needed to talk. We needed to hear, they needed to talk. They needed us to say, we're here, we're listening. Not that we offered any advice for some of these things, but they needed to say what they were doing. And it was important that they knew we could listen. And also to be comfortable in silence. There are moments that there's nothing to say. You know, we know this from our tradition when we go to a shiva house, that we don't talk. Chazal were very smart. The sages were very smart. Sometimes words get in the way. And so being in silence is okay. Being in silence is often what we need to do and even if it's on the phone, you can say, I hear your breathing, I'm here. You don't have to say anything, I'm here. I'm here for you, I'm here for you. You know, when people are in the bomb shelters, I'm here for you, you don't need to talk. I'm just here. It's hard not to give advice. People are asking advice. I'm not saying never to give advice. We don't even know the answers most of the time to these crazy situations we're in, but mostly to do it without judgment. There's no way that we can really know we're not God here. We don't know what's right, what's wrong. We all try our best. And so to give people the space to hear if we have wisdom, yeah. I mean, we all have life experience, right? We've come from places where we've coped. But to do it in a way which is gentle, which is open, which is welcoming, which allows a person to know that if it doesn't work for them, they don't have to accept it, but to, to offer it with kindness, and I think that the, this, this framework of starting to listen to people this way will allow that connection to be more fluid. It's not going to be, I'm having a conversation and this is what we're going to accomplish. It's going to be that we're going to be engaged, especially because this is going to go on for a while in a dialogue that will allow us to feel less alone, less afraid, and less anxious. Now, there are a lot of coping strategies. We're going to give you a few ideas specific things. But what I want to say is that the most important thing to recognize is that since we all come from complex backgrounds with many narratives, traumas, joy, successes, failures, wonderful things, terrible things, we all come with our best and our worst to this situation. What do I mean by that? We come with our best capacities but we also come with our biggest pains and vulnerabilities, things that have happened to us in the past that this is a trigger for, we are ripe to be re-triggered again. And so we need to be thinking when we're reaching out to other people about what we, what is our capacity? What are we capable of doing? And I don't just mean in general, I mean now. What are we capable of doing now? And I mean now, not even this week, maybe this hour. 
I had a conversation with a friend recently. Wonderful woman, does tons, chesed, mamash, it's a decade. And was feeling badly because she wasn't offering every open room in her house for some of the people who were evacuated. Because thank God, there are people that are doing that and we're all trying our best. Was she doing a million other things for her family, for the other making meals and donating? We can't all do everything. And there's a feeling a lot of times when we're in the in the presence of Gedolim, and we really are, we're watching people step up in ways that are unbelievable, beyond belief. I mean, we really are in the presence of giants and angels and people with huge hearts, but everybody's capacity is their capacity. And nobody should feel that they need to measure up to somebody else's standard. Nobody else should feel that they need to do just because everybody's doing it, what everybody's doing. We need to search and say, what can I do now? What can I do today? Tomorrow's another day. Or say, maybe tomorrow I'll do something. But today, this is what I know I can do. And that's a very important guideline that we need to do, especially because we're dealing with our own frustration. And you're hearing me talk about you because I'm recognizing that you yourselves need to take care of yourselves in order to reach out to other people. This is a message that you carry forward to your family members, of course, also. But I'm saying it to you because we are in this together. This is not just our experience. This is your experience also. This is very real for you. So this idea of capacity and this ability of limitations is something we need to recognize. We also need to share that with other people. And it's a very important reminder in these days because there's never enough. There's so much to do that we could all be busy 24-7, but we can't be. We need to sleep. We need to take care of ourselves. Laura, I want to ask you about that for a minute. I think it's really sure. it's very interesting because I think some of the time, I know we feel this in Israel and I feel this from people abroad as well. There's always this sense like we have to be doing something. We have to be volunteering. We have to be helping someone. We have to be writing our congressman, whatever it is. And if I'm hearing you correctly, there is also this sense of understanding like you can't always be doing everything all the time. You, you sometimes need to take a step back as well. Am I understanding that right? You're understanding it right. And I'll say something else. I think that the idea of this, I, this war being not a day or two it makes it all the more important. In other words, what we can do today, maybe in a week, we'll do something else, right? If everybody did a little bit, you know, Klal Yisrael is how many millions of Jews and humanity is how many millions of people. And I, this is on humanity too, guys. You know, this is not just our war. This is the war of world. This is really the war of humanity, right? This is the war of good against evil. This is the war against slaughter and brutality, okay? But if every human and every, every person did a tiny bit or even a little bit more than their minimum, we would be okay. So we each have to step up in a way that's safe for us and, and, kept, and our capacity. Otherwise we won't sustain it. So I think people have to come with a sense of reality and a sense of pacing ourselves. And yeah, what can I do now? And not what other people do it. And I'm, everybody's stepping up and everybody does need to, to some degree, but it looks so different. It could be that somebody just, I mean, we have a hotline where we reach out at Life's Door to elderly people. It's a, it's a 15 minute phone call. If every person that did that in our country, you know, they would feel great, right? You reach out to a shut in elderly person who's terrified of missiles, who might've gone through six wars and been through the Holocaust. And that little one phone call that they do once or twice a week, that's a great feeling. And that might be what somebody does besides taking care of themselves, because that's the first thing we do, right? You have to take care of yourself, right, Rabbi? That's that's one of the first rules, but absolutely. And so I think people need to give themselves permission to not be superwoman, not be superman. We are not here to superheroes. You know, it resonates for me so strongly because we went through something and it seems so tiny now, right? A pandemic, like who thought that would be the worst thing, right? And do you remember the doctors and the nurses, the applause and their heroes? I even have right here, something that somebody gave my husband, Ben Korn, who's a co-founder. Co you can't see it because of the screen thing. It says, not all superheroes wear capes, some wear scrubs. And I, I take issue with that because nobody needs to be a superhero. We're not God, we're humans. The doctors burned out. They're all paying the price for this. The nurses, they were, they were falling apart during COVID. There was no option, okay? But that's not a good thing. That's something we want to guard against. We don't want to be superheroes, but we want to we want to do what we feel gives us purpose. And we're going to get to that in a minute. Now, as I say this, next slide, as I say this, I want people to understand I'm going to offer a framework because I, I find this framework to be very helpful. It might be familiar to some of you. Um, Professor Muli Lahad, who's a brilliant man, many, many years developed this model in his work 
over decades in the um, north of Israel. He's at Tel Chai um, Academy, and he developed this model based on his observation of sustained trauma that mostly the children, but the families experience from the Katusha rockets. How many wars have we had? You know, let's count back then. And what he developed is a framework, and I'm, I'm not going to give a lecture on this. This could be a whole course, but I want to offer this to you as a guideline to help you understand how you can best help yourself and best help other people. Okay, so this is a model in which he found that people have what I like to call channels in which they cope. They have like a, a native, it's like a channel, a road that they over time in their lives have developed as their sensibility, okay? And so this, this sensibility that you are developing that you over your life is something that you can access now for yourselves and also as you support other people right? You need to understand you, what you do to cope, but you also want to be able to offer this to the people that you're talking to, right? Your family members, your friends that are here, okay? Now, again, not a lecture, but I just want you to think in your lives now, each of you, about something you've experienced. No, we're back there. Something that you've experienced, something in your life that was very, very difficult. I want each of you to tap into something that you've experienced that was very, very difficult, And think about what was the thing or the things that allowed you to cope? What allowed you to get through that experience? And as I go through these different channels, I want you to think about you in that situation and what, what it might be. Because as we become aware of where our resources, where our resilience comes from, that's, that's a clue about how we can now help ourselves. And likewise, we can ask those kinds of questions to people if we know, if we don't know the answer, and often we won't, what helped them in the past? You know, if you talk to somebody who's scared to have her children outside and you say to her, during other times in Israel, not like these, this is worse than ever, but during other times when you had stress about maybe pigouin that are happening, you know, terrorist attacks, what was it, something that allowed you to get through the day? These are the questions that we're asking ourselves. So it could be, he, there's an acronym, it's basic PH. So it could be our belief, our emuna. That means not only belief in God, it could be belief that the world's going to be okay. It belief that things will work out. The belief, the core sense that I know something, I believe something. For many people, that's what they harness and that's what we can harness and that's what we can direct our, peop our, our friends and family to also tap into. Affect, for a lot of people, they're flooded with emotion, right? So for those of the people that talking to somebody therapeutically or in a support group or in a hotline is very, very important because their affect needs to be addressed. You know, it, it's ironic. I mean, a lot of people need to tune out on an affect level. You know, somebody said to me just the other day, I need to watch silly half hour Seinfelds before I go to sleep because I cannot escape the noise of move, of uh, of all the TV that's going on with all the news. So I need to, to change my affect. I need to laugh. Now, obviously it's very hard to laugh, but sometimes people need to force themselves to go there. For some people, it's a social outlet and that's very tricky. For some people, it's not a social outlet. For some people, they wanna be alone and they wanna process by themselves. But for some people, it's talking, it's being with other people. It's being in Kihila. You know, when I went to Bet Knesset yesterday, I was scared to go, I really was. But then I thought, you know, I need to be with my peers. I need to be with my community. And that social cohesion that we all know is so important. Being alone is not good for most people. Imagination, this is where creativity is so important. Children in particular, painting and music and creative arts. This is a place, again, this is not gonna make us win the war, but this is gonna make us survive the war. And most importantly, I will tell you, this, this will help us be less traumatized through this process. There will be a day after. What will it look like? You know, my grandparents who escaped the Nazis, my father, my aunt, they did not process. It was shut down until Elie Wiesel wrote Night. Nobody talked about the horrors and the atrocities. We're not ready to talk about it all, but we need to process it. And sometimes words will not do it anyhow. So our creativity, our imagination, our minds, that's the place that we go to. And so thinking about using those outlets now, especially for children, but not only for children, taking time to just allow our mind to be an escape a little bit. Imagine what it will be like. 
You know, I, I read something so beautiful about somebody saying, you know, the day after the war, what will it look like? We want it to look beautiful. We want our land to look beautiful. We want our children to grow. Let's imagine that. It's not going to make it happen, but it'll allow us to hold our belief and our hope going forward. C is cognitive. And that I want to emphasize is probably the most trickiest thing today. People who focus on that cognitive pathway are people that like information. They like logic. Stereotypically, they say men more than women. I don't know, but cognitive processes are great when you can make sense out of things. We're in a dicey place when it comes to that day and night and but there are people that need to have answers. And so those are the people that will go on the internet all day long. Those are the people that will ask questions. Those are the people that will get solace out of reading briefs from the State Department. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying we need to know what works for us and we need to be very careful now because there's such an information overload if we are those kind of people because we're in a very unusual situation about how much information is out there. You know, in a normal time, people read back in the day, people read a newspaper, they listened to the radio. Now it's all the time. And so information for people who, who are thirsty for it can drown us. So we have to be very careful. And the last is physical. And, and I want to talk about physical from two elements. One is physical in terms of where we feel this anxiety. When you talk to your family members and they talk about physical symptoms, honor it, it's real. I mean, people do die of heart attacks from anxiety. It is, it, there are things that go in our body that raise the hormones and change the equilibrium. It is not a joke when people feel something to say, oh, it's only in your body. It's psychosomatic. No, we know now the mind and the body are related and they cause processes to go on. These thoughts and feelings cause processes to go on in our bodies. So we need to address that. I'm not just talking about taking medication. Some people need that. I'm talking about simple techniques, breathing, simple yoga. The YouTube is filled with yoga activities for little kids also. Breathing, taking time to rest, paying attention to that we sleep, paying attention that we're eating. If we're one of those people that our physical reaction is so strong, we need to double up on making sure that our physical well-being is being addressed. So these are guidelines, again, for us, for you in America, if that's where you are, but also for you to share that with the people that you're talking to. What are the pathways that you've coped with in the past? How have these ty types of things, and usually we're a mix of several, how are those things accessible for you now? We can choose these things. We have choices right now. It seems like we don't, but we do have choices. How we cope is a choice that we have right now. It's sometimes very hard, but we can choose these things. Next one. Laura, I just want to add that I think that the cognitive part here is really challenging because people from afar are seeing things through the news or what they're seeing on the net. And it doesn't really give a picture of life here in Israel. You're sort of imagining it. Everyone's running for cover all the time. And that's true maybe for some people. But, you know, when you're in Jerusalem or in Modin, where I live or other places, that's not really the reality right now. Don't get me wrong. It's not a rosy picture here. But, you know, Israelis know how to cope in some ways because we had to learn in that, in that respect. And it's important to recognize that what you're seeing on the Internet is not representative sort of, of what's actually going on here. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to be really minded to the fact that the media is a business and they... Um, for better or for worse, we'll repeat images over and over and over again because sensationalism is what sells. It's it's horrible. I mean, let, let's be let's understand that. You know, the media is a business. Sometimes it serves our needs. Oftentimes, it doesn't serve our needs. But as as viewers, as consumers, it's a lot of junk food. It's a lot of stuff that's not healthy for us. They're not looking out. CNN and all these radio stations, by the way, when we saw CNN, when we were in the States, we were blown away by how supportive they were for Israel. That could change, God forbid, in a minute. But still, they're not, their agenda is not taking care of us. Their agenda is not even necessarily giving information, right? Their agenda is ratings, okay? Let's, it's not a public service. This is a business. And so we need to be very mindful that we're consuming things that could be harmful for us, and we need to set limits on it. You know, not to watch the news, I'm going to say it again at the end, but not to watch the news more than necessary is a really good tip. I can tell you when I was watching the daily news all day long, 
And then I pulled back because my grandchildren, whose father is up north, came into our house. I felt I felt better at the end of the day that I just checked in a few times a day. You know, we all have pinging and everybody's calling us. If we need to know something, we'll know. We don't need to watch it. So it's a very important point you're making, Rabbi Brody. I appreciate your emphasizing that. Okay, the next thing I want to say is about priorities. And I want to say that because I talked about before the issue of, in general, that we can't do everything. But I think I want to emphasize this even more. Priorities mean today, in the next few hours, what do I need to do? It also means who are the people that I have to prioritize. Now, you are far away, right? So you have people in Israel, but you also have people maybe in your home, right? In your own home, you have people that are there living with you often. We can't forget about the normal life that has to continue. You know, I say this to people who are suffering from serious diseases as well. You know, on one hand, yeah, we have to cope with the crisis, but you also have to maintain the health and well-being of the people around us. And that is a very difficult juggling, juggling act. Very, I'm not here to tell you I know how to do it, by the way, but being mindful of it and to say, okay, what is my priority now? You know, if there was an attack in Israel, God forbid, and so it's near somebody where I live, now I need to know, okay? Maybe... An hour before or an hours later, you don't need to be involved as much and you can attend to some of the other people and things in your life that need your attention and, and need your attention because they're also going through something. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot, at, really at all, except for a point later about children, but children are very important to mention because they are very vulnerable, as well as older people. But children are very vulnerable because they don't always have the communication to be able to express their anxiety. And so our priorities may need to turn to the children in our spaces, maybe even those that are sitting in America, whose cousins are here, whose siblings are here, whose aunts and uncles are here. You know, they're hearing and even the littlest child knows that something is wrong. They will pick up on it. And so we have to think all the time. We have to keep shifting our priorities and questioning and saying, okay, for today, for the next few hours, what can, what do I need to focus on? And not feel so stuck on the fact that if things shift, we can shift our priorities. But to ask that question and to really understand that it's something that um, will change, but that we need to know that we're doing it because we, because we cannot do everything all the time. That is not going to happen. And as we think about priorities, I want to go to the space of purpose, okay? And this is what you said also, that people want to do something. There's a call to action and people want to do something. And that is probably the most spectacular part of this experience now is how much people care and you all there care. And it means a lot to every single person sitting here in Israel. It means a lot to me. You care. And your sense of purpose and what drives you to do things to help is not only helping us, it's helping you, and then you can help us more. So there's a cycle going on. What gives you purpose? Every single person here has a different thing that gives them a sense of purpose in a big way and in smaller ways. And that is what helps us find meaning in this whole story. We're not going to explain atrocities. We'll never explain atrocities. But we can somehow dig into this story and find a place that will give us a sense of meaning. You know, Viktor Frankl wrote book, books about it. We all know that there are the worst places that humanity has ever seen. And somehow or another, people found a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose within those horrible, horrible, horrible places. And that's what we all need to do. And when you're talking to yourselves, but when you're talking to the people that are on the other side of the ocean here in Israel, helping people feel what they can control, what gives them a sense of purpose, is going to speak volumes to their ability to get through every single day. So with that, I want to talk about what I think is the most important part of this conversation today. And we have about 20 minutes left, and I want to leave time for questions. Hope. Hope. Go back. We can't live without hope. But you know what? Hope comes out of the darkest places. It's usually out of fear that we try to access hope. It's usually when we're in the most terrifying space that we recognize the tremendous power of hope. Now, that's a word that seems huge, right? We have a national anthem, Atikva, it's hope. It's huge. What is hope? You know, do we give hope? Can we give hope? Is it false hope? 
It's a word that people throw around all the time in the space that our organization, it's a word that's ab abused actually sometimes. Hope is something real. And I wanna offer you a way of thinking about that for the next couple of minutes. The model that we have worked with here at LifeStore for a good seven or eight years is a model that was created 20 years ago, had nothing to do with the wars in particular. It was a model created by Professor Rick Snyder at the University of Kansas. And Rick it was one of the fathers of positive psychology. And he identified in his work over many, many years, three key elements where hope can thrive. Real hope, not false hope, real hope that people in desperate situations in dismal situations, in situations in which it seems like there's no impasse, no solution, still are able to find hope. And we've seen it. We've seen it in our work thousands of times. One, the first element is a goal. Now, I just said to you, a sense of purpose. Every one of us has something that is meaningful to them that we can identify a goal. I'm not talking about saving the world. I'm not talking about raising a million dollars. I'm talking about something that in the next week or few days, you can identify something that you can do, that you can do, that's in your capacity, that you can do, a goal that's meaningful for you. And for you, it could be something else. If you're connected to an organization, you want to reach out to that organization and you want to create a goal around that particular space because that's where your heart is, that's going to be your goal. If there's a person or a group of people or a community, your goal needs to be meaningful for you, not your neighbors, not somebody else, you, and it has to be achievable. This is a goal that is real, that you can attain. I'm sure you've come up with a lot of them over the past few days, and I'm sure you've done them. The problem is with goals is a lot of times we don't figure out that we have to figure out a way to get to that goal. And so Rick Snyder's model said for, every, for a person to have hope in their life, it's not enough to have a goal. We need to have a sense of agency and motivation. And that comes from having pathways to get to that goal, a roadmap to get to that goal, steps to get to that goal that anticipates what might go wrong and what are the obstacles. Each of you can do that. And each of you can have people that you talk to do that. When somebody's here and they feel despair, you can say, what is it that you can do today? When you talk to your sister, your, your neighbor, your friend, the person that lived around the corner for you that made Aliyah. I mean, my friends are calling me every day saying, what can I do? Specific goal for me helped me. What is it that I can do today? And how can I get there? Maybe the pathway is joining up with somebody else. Maybe that goes back to that social component that I talked about before. Maybe I can reach out to somebody and they can help me. Because when you have a goal and you have a pathway, all of a sudden something changes and you realize there are things that we have agency over. There are things that we can control. There are things that we can impact on. The world is crazy. There are things we can't control. I cannot control what's going to go on tonight on the northern border with Hezbollah. What I can control is that my bomb shelter is ready, that my kids know that there's snacks there, that my friends know that I'll call them as soon as I'm safe. I can do that. And that makes me feel different. That makes me feel different about what tonight is going to look like. Am I scared? Yeah, I'm scared. I'm not going to lie. But I feel different about how I'm going to get through tonight because I have a, I had a goal to make sure that that miklat, that that bomb shelter is settled. And when you talk to people and you feel that they're losing it, and you don't know what to offer them, you can say to them, let's think of something that you can do, dear. Let's think of something that you can do for yourself. Let's think of something that you can do and let's figure out how you can do it. And you guys being a little bit out of it, you can have insight because you can help this balagan in our head, this crazy noise in our head, get a little clearer and say, what is one thing you can do in the next day? And it's really important. Somebody just wrote, I try to see friends and change subjects. Whatever you can do to keep focused, whatever you can do to stay focused on a goal. So this model is a really important thing. I will tell you then, Michal, you could put it in the chat if you want. We actually even developed an app, uh, a mobile app that helps people work on these goals. So this is something that you can practice that you can do, but you don't need mobile apps and you don't need workshops. We do them all the time. What you need is this model. It's a very, very simple model and it's very easy to implement, but it requires those components, a goal pathway and a sense of how I'm going to do it. What are the strategies that I'm going to do? And I encourage people to think the smallest, this is the app, the smallest, smallest, smallest goal that you can imagine. It changes the experience of the here and the now. When there's so much I can't control, having a sense of hope will come from what I can control. 
Next slide. So what is a hope that you can focus on now? I want to, I want you to maybe throw out in the chat if some of you want to. What is a hope that I can focus on now? I want you to practice it with me, okay? Throw them out on the chat if somebody has some ideas. One goal that can make me feel a sense of hope. One small goal. What could it be? Or what's one small goal you might offer and suggest with somebody that you love here in Israel? Any ideas? One thing that you can do that's within your capacity. Donate blood. Fabulous. Probably very little obstacles. If you need a ride to the place, reach out a friend and say hi. Brilliant. Maybe there's a time zone difference. Send a message. Check in with your family. Reach your grandchildren by video. These are all achievable goals. Do you understand how powerful that is that you do something despite all the crazy lack of control? Donate money. These are all goals that give us a sense of empowerment, of agency, of I can, that I can influence, that I have impact, that I'm making a difference. Writing family funny things to distract them. That's brilliant. That's wonderful. Volunteering. There's, there's so many. There's so many. I want each of you to take some time right after the seminar or whenever you can is to come up with a goal and come up with strategies on how you're going to get to that goal. And if you need to find ways for people to help you do it, because I'm telling you, it will help you and use this for other people too, that you reach out to. It'll help them. It's grounding. And as we pull to the close, I want to go to the next couple of slides, Michal. What can, so in summary, there's a lot we can do, okay? What can we do for ourselves and our loved ones? One, I've said it to validate, it's natural to feel anxiety. It's natural to feel fear, validate it. It's nothing to hide. We wanna connect with people. We wanna talk again with children in the way that's appropriate for children. Practicing mindfulness, we started that way. And we wanna take actions that we can. That's all about the goals that we've talked about, things that we can do. And we can also look at what we can offer other people, right? What has helped us in the past? What was something that you have done in the past that helped you get through a rough time? Holding onto regular routines as much as possible, exercising and eating and reading and trying to, if there's gonna be school or not school, we're trying to give kids a sense of structure, limiting the news, please, please don't look at CNN all day long. Nothing in CNN, just don't look at anybody all day long. You want to build hope. You have a tool for that. Spirituality, look, we're very blessed to have a belief system. We're very blessed. Not everybody does. And I'm not saying you're all religious, but to have a belief system that brings you together, that brings you within community, and also to seek professional support. You know, there's so much going on right now to get support. So if you feel, if you hear from somebody that you're talking to that you really don't think that they're managing, it's okay for them to call a hotline, to call their family doctor, and try to see if there's some advice that can be offered. Next slide. There's so much that we can't control. Many of you know the serenity prayer, okay? You don't have to read it, you see it on the screen. There's so much we cannot control. Part of it is knowing what we can change. Part of it is knowing that we cannot change everything, but there are things that we can make a difference in. Your being on this webinar says that you want to make a difference. You're caring about the people here. That already makes a difference. You know, Rabbi Brody, you said people feel they don't know what they can do. Being aware and present and reaching out. There's somebody that sends me a heart every morning on an emoji heart on my WhatsApp. I can't tell you how important that is to me. I don't even need to read anything. It's actually great because I don't, I can't have the bandwidth to read anymore, but I know she's thinking of me. That's huge. Being with our pets, somebody wrote too, that's beautiful. So we need to know what we can do and choose those things. Now I want you to take a moment and, and just allow yourself to be in a breath. Before we have a few more minutes, we're gonna have time for questions. I want you to take a moment and be in a breath again. I've, talk, I've done a lot of talking. I've thrown a lot at you. I know that. It's a lot of information. Think about where you have the capacity to do something meaningful for yourself and breathe that in. Think about what you can control. And then think about what you might offer in the next conversation you have with somebody you call in the States. How might you start that conversation? How might you listen differently? How might you create a safe space? 
Probably you're doing most of it anyhow. I can guarantee you most of you are good souls with open hearts. But because we're so anxious, we don't bring our best self to the story, unfortunately. We don't. And so we're trying to bring our best, 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 best self, our biggest hearts, our biggest compassion, and our most effective way. We have to be effective here, not just good. We have to be effective. So you have things. You have things in your skill set. I have no question that your hearts are big. Your mind and your heart have to link now. You take the skills. You take your experience, you take your toolkits and you listen to what's needed of the person on the other side of the phone or the Zoom or the WhatsApp. They'll know that you care and you'll already be in a better place, both of you. You know, the world is in a really hard place and Albert Einstein, he really saw it up too, right? I know, I know that we're not standing alone. I know that Israel is doing this with you and with all of your communities, and that is huge. We could not do this alone. So I said, it's not only our fight, but we couldn't do it alone. It would be impossible, and we're going to make a difference. I'm really grateful for all of you of coming together. I think we have about five or seven minutes or so for questions, and um, we'll open it up for questions. And Rabbi Brody, you can moderate if you want. I know there's some yeah. in the Q and A that we want to share. Devora, one of the questions here was about: Is there a distinction here about dealing with anxiety as opposed to anger? I think one of the things that people are saying is they feel anger. I mean, anger about dead lives, anger about responses in the world, their friends, and. You know, would you say that the mechanism of how to address that is the same or different? I think it's different. I think it's very different. I think it's really important for us to recognize that there's a lot of anger. I think that anger is extremely powerful and destructive. I feel it too. So I'm not, I'm not condemning anybody for feeling anger. I feel a lot of anger. I think what we want to try to do with the anger for now is to try to marginalize that anger for now. Because anger, the anger about this situation is deep, it's wide, it's vast, and it's raging. It's raging. And we can't contain that anger right now. And for us to cope, for us to manage now, we can't use and drain our resources on anger. We, sh we will. There will be a day after. That will be the day to look at that anger, to deal with that anger, to process that anger. But now... It is so toxic and potent that I don't believe we have the capacity to be in that place and in a place to cope. Now, anxiety is the feeling, the experience of all those feelings, the stress that we feel. There are skills that we can do that, but katan, small skills, some of them we talked about today, okay? They don't, they don't wipe around the anger. They don't wipe around the sadness. They don't take away the stress, but we can manage. We can get through the day if we cope with that anxiety, some people need get med medication also. You know, for some people, it's a glass of wine at the end of the day or a cup of tea. But we need to take realistic approaches to manage our anxiety by doing things that are within our control. I don't believe right now, given the hugeness of this, that we can hold the anger yet. It took how many years till Ellie Wiesel wrote Night for the world to discuss, talk about the Shoah, right? How many years? 20 years or so? I think that we are in a time like that. We are in an unspeakable time with unspeakable atrocities and that anger will just bring us down. I know here in Israel, there's a temptation, no matter where you are on the political spectrum to say we should have and we could have, it doesn't help us today. And if those people who are learning lessons and fixing things quickly are paying attention, fine. They don't need us to be angry now. They don't need, we need support. We need to join together. Anger divides. Anger causes rhetoric that is destructive. And anger sinks us. It just drains our batteries. And we don't have the luxury of being drained right now. We just don't. And so I, I encourage people to name the anger right. I didn't talk about journaling. I wanted to spend all time on that too, but write it maybe and put it aside and put it in a drawer and say that I'm going to deal with the day after. That anger must be processed. 
but I don't think we have the luxury of dealing with it. Now that's me. That's nobody else talking. That's me. I don't see it. I, I know I see this with people who are sick also. And, you know, there's lots about anger. It just doesn't help us now. We don't have the time or space. Thank you. There, there's a question here about practical suggestions to deal with rising overt anti-Semitism in America or how the international support might change quickly the condemnation. I'll tell you, just listening, I mean, I'm also nervous about that, listening to what you're saying here, one of the things I'm thinking about is, of course, is if you're in an area where there's really overt anti-Semitism, you're in danger, that's a different type of nervousness here. But at least what I'm hearing, you know, seeing from afar, I don't think people feel endangered on a daily basis from anti-Semitism right now, and I hope we don't get to that place. But the other thing I you know, want to remind people is that, particularly when it comes to condemnation of the world, there's only so much we can do in influencing, right? So we all think like if you post one more thing on Facebook or you write one more letter or this or that, it's going to change things. And we drive ourselves crazy about the annoying comments that someone made and you spend the next 30 minutes hovering over that. On It's, it, it's not very effective and it's really not healthy on a personal level. So I, I, I think you know, it goes. I, I agree with you, but I think it goes back to again what gives us a sense of purpose. Because for certain people, that is what gives them a sense of purpose that they wake up and they're dealing with social media and they're posting. And I, there's a downside to it. I'm not saying there isn't, but for certain people, that is a coping mechanism, and I honor that. I really honor that. I think that we need to understand. That's what I said about the media and information overload. There are slippery slopes here. There are things that are toxic to us that are dangerous, and we need to balance that with the things that give us meaning, give us a sense of agency and purpose. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I hear what you're saying and I agree completely that it can totally take over, but for certain people that that actually might be what allows them to get through the day. And especially if they're, if they're good at it, you know, if they really have a skill. So I, I think that, you know, it's a, it's a balancing act. And I think that that's really most importantly, what I would say is for most of these things is to know what helps me what helps me deal with the person that I'm talking to? Because again, that's what we're talking about here is different needs and different sides of the ocean. And then trying to align the values and the sense of purpose that I have with the things that I can make a difference with. So sometimes it could be there. And I think we just need to enter with caution. That's all. The enter with caution. The same way though, emotion, you know, enter with caution. Do we want to bleed all over with our emotions? We can't, we don't have that. So all of these are places of moderation and modulation. And that's why reaching out together is helpful because we can reflect to one another about where we feel, how we hear that things are maybe a little scary for somebody and how they need to maybe pull in a little bit on something. That's great. I think we're hitting the end of our time, uh, but this has been fantastic. And just the one thing I sort of reflect on that I've been seeing in Israel, and I, I, I think from abroad as well is that I sort of divide the Israeli population right now between soldiers and evacuees, and those are really directly, and then everyone else who's doing something to support those people. I mean, it's incredible, and how much efforts there are right now to support. And I think that one of the reasons why that's happened is that people find that, besides they want to do something, they find it as a really positive outlet. And so our ability for anyone abroad to do something good in this world, to help people in Israel, of course, but even to do something good, because there's a lot of darkness in the world right now, and our ability to add a little bit of light, to be the littlest amount, donating blood, helping someone, calling someone, whatever else it might be, I think it adds a tremendous amount, gives us strength, gives us hope. And, and I, I think that's what's going on in Israel, and I hope that can go well, help people abroad as well. You know, I want to reiterate that and thank everybody for coming. I think that we're in the world right now where the balance of good and evil has tipped. And I believe, I believe that by doing good, we'll, we have the power to shift that. The Israeli army will fight and everybody will fight, but we on the ground, there's so much chesed and we're that's how we're going to win. That's really how we're going to win. Laura, Michal, thank you so much. And thank you to Nefesh Benefesh and all the people there uh, for all the work that you're doing. And uh, bless everyone for strength and, and solidarity. I know we feel it in Israel. We feel the support coming from abroad. It means a lot. It really means a lot. And, and we hope that everyone stays strong and safe during this process. And God willing, we will get through this. Uh, so thank you for your insights and this knowledge. And we look forward to being in touch with everyone. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you.